Let me add just a little bit more to our last lecture about why Malthus' prediction of mass starvation uh, and a uh, precipitous downturn in economic wealth, macroeconomic wealth, didn't happen, even in spite of his accurate prediction of an increase in population. One of the things that happened was called the Industrial Revolution. Again, Say was making the point that if human beings can be productive and produce something of value for a neighbor at a price that that neighbor can afford, well then that creates a process at which that increasing supply of stuff increases faster than the population and the prices of all goods going down and we have more and more stuff in comparison to, relatively speaking, less people per amount of stuff, which means that the standard of living can go higher. Yeah, we got more people, but we got more stuff per person. And the more people we have, the more productive we are. And Malthus' prediction did not happen. And this technology is the key. Um, during the Industrial Revolution, there was a guy named Thomas Watt. W-A-T-T. -T. No. Thomas Watt? I think it was Thomas Watt. Maybe we got Thomas Malthus on the brain. James Watt. It was James Watt. There we go. James Watt. Uh, if you go to some of these villages around this neck of the woods and um, small towns, you see plaques established in 1821 and 1798 and all that sort of stuff. And they're all on some sort of, uh, I don't know how you're supposed to say this word, creek. In rural Ohio, it's creek, uh, but creek, creek, whatever. There's always some waterway there. And if, if you have enough records or poke around enough, there's usually some sort of mill uh, there. Um, where you dammed up the water and it comes over this thing and turns this wheel here in the middle of the wheel is a shaft and you turn the shaft and that's thing called torque. And if you've got torque, you got power. So what they developed was what I would call a free energy machine. It's a free energy machine. Now you, it takes money to build the machine, but once you get that mill built and you've got the waterway there, the water just comes down the hill for free. You don't have to pay to get the water to come down the hill. It rains and it comes down the hill. When it comes down the hill, it dams up and then it goes over there and turns this shaft and you got energy. You didn't pay for it. You had to pay for the machine, but you got free energy. It's an effective free energy machine. You guys look at me like I got three eyes. Am I okay? Right? I know. I'm not supposed to say free energy, right? There's no such thing as free energy. But for them, they built the thing and it just keeps turning. And now once you got that, you can turn that into a grist mill where before if you've got wheat and you want to make bread, you've got to put it in a stone thing and then you've got to beat on it until you finally get flour. And that's not very efficient. But if you could put it in there, it just turns this thing and it just grinds it down, mesmerizes the thing, and pretty soon just flour comes out. You know, and you didn't have to even break a sweat. <laughs> you just pour it in there and out it comes. That's pretty cool. Or you could take it and you could kind of turn it on edge and get a big blade on there and you could turn it into a sawmill rather than a grist mill. Well, up until that point in time, if you wanted to make lumber, you had to get a team of horses and go in the woods and then cut down a tree and then hook it up there and pull it all the way to the lumber mill and pull it up in there and then push it into that wheel that's turning around with all these gears from the water coming down and make lumber. With the Industrial Revolution, we were able to take the sawmill to the timber rather than take the timber to the sawmill. Because what happened is you've got this big cylinder here and you take it out in the woods and you find a little creek and you put a little water in it and then you build a little fire here and it's got a little out thing here with a little thing and then it's got something going around like this, something like that. A pinwheel effect. I'm talking about pinwheel effect. And when you heat this water up for every cubic foot of water, you're going to get 1,800, roughly, or more cubic feet of steam. So this cubic foot of water right here is going to get want to get almost 2,000 times bigger when it turns into steam because we put a fire underneath it. 
And it's going to want to get out of here really, really bad. And when it gets out of there really, really bad, it's going to hit this thing and it's going to turn that turbine. Once it turns the turbine, it's hooked to a shaft. Once you've got a shaft, you've got torque. Once you've got torque, you're on the loose. You just hook it to a grist mill, hook it to a sawmill, hook it to whatever you want. So now we can take it in there, we can get the lumber, and we can take the lumber out, and now our productivity increases. Instead of having to bring all of our stuff across the country in a Conestoga wagon, we can put two rails side by side, put one of these things in front of a little choo-choo train, make it turn the wheels because we got torque, and we can pull stuff all the way across the country for the cost of running coal to keep the fire burning. All of a sudden, human productivity just went up and up and up and up and up, which used to take a lot of particular energy. So it was things like the Industrial Revolution that Malthus did not see that increased technology at a phenomenal rate, and his predictions did not come true. Let me talk about the classical growth model from a historical perspective, from a historical perspective. I call this illustration the monk strategy of wealth production. I call this illustration the monk strategy of wealth production because it is a historical, um, I don't think it's too mythical, I think it's pretty close to the way things actually happened, um, to give us a, a, a historical summary of what this classical growth model is all about. Um, you all know that once upon a time there was a Roman Empire, right? Yeah, there was a Roman Empire. And uh, it, like every empire to date, it fell apart. Uh, and it fell apart because of corruption from within. Um, and the, 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 the Caesars were quite corrupt. And um, things were so bad that when the barbarian hordes came, the population didn't know which was worse. Uh, is the current government system worse or are the barbarian hordes worse? And for the most part, they just refused to fight because the government was so bad and the Caesar were so bad and so exploitive and stuff. And they just said, I don't, I don't really care if it goes down. If it goes down, that's, that's okay. And the people just refused to fight. And so they got turned over. Anyway, the greatest one world government in history um, we talk about one world government now, but that's we've been there and done that. It, it, it kind of collapsed. And when it collapsed, everybody's standard of living went down. Because it was the Roman Empire that kept the Mediterranean open for commerce and kept the bandits at bay and the pirates at bay. And it was the Roman Empire that built all these roads, actually a road all the way over to China. And they were going over to China and bringing stuff back. They called it Silk Road. Um, and there were soldiers there, and there were garrisons all the way. They, they were all the way over to England, and they, 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 had, they had it covered. And with that large government, you could have very large trade and get things from Africa and all sorts of things that we wouldn't have had otherwise. But when that fell, when the Roman government fell, then there went the... Roman Navy and pirates just flourished on the high seas and there were no more Roman soldiers to patrol the Roman roads and so traveling was very very risky and you had to go in groups and you had to be careful because if you laid down went to sleep not only would your money bag be cut off but you might have your throat slit at the same time and so trade just plummeted. And we know that trade allows people to better their lifestyle because they get trade something of lesser value for something of more value, and now they got more options and they're happier. And at the same time, one of the things that was happening was that, that the, the Roman Empire had to have somebody to blame for their economic woes, and they kept society together by an oath of allegiance. 
and you had to give the Roman Empire this oath of allegiance or you were considered a terrorist or the equivalent of a terrorist. And so there would be public ceremonies in which uh, a statue of the emperor would be coming through and people would put a pinch of incense on the altar of the Caesar there. Um, and they would pledge of allegiance and say Caesar is Lord. He's ruler. He's king. He's in charge. He's boss. He's the big deal. He's 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 the center, the the apex of what's keeping our culture glued together. But unfortunately, at that point in time, as some of you read the New Testament, there was another group of people of of a converted sect of Jews now tag-along Jews called Gentiles who are getting into the picture there, called some self-Christian. And for them, they had an ethical religious problem. Because according to their understanding of who this Jewish guy named Jesus out of Nazareth was, that they couldn't say Caesar is Lord. Because one of the slogans of the Christians, according to St. Paul, was Jesus is Lord. He's the king guy. He's, he's the boss guy. He's the big guy. He's, he's in charge of everything, and everybody's supposed to acknowledge him as king. And that was just thumbing their nose at the Roman government and Caesar. Governments don't take that very lightly. Government, the Roman government was extremely tolerant of every single religion out there. You've got some bizarre religion. they got a pantheon. They'd be more than happy to take a, a, a monument of God and put it in the pantheon with all the other gods. They, they were, no, no problem. That's why they got a pantheism, pantheon, all, all, all gods. You put all the gods in there. The problem was with this Jewish, they got special dispensation, and the Christians got the special dispensation because they were considered a sect of the Jews, and the Jews didn't like that. And anyway, their god didn't fit. It just wouldn't fit in the pantheon. And they were saying that our god is creator God, and he's in charge of all you, including the emperor, and no, we're not going to put a pinch of incense on the altar of Caesar, and we're not going to say Caesar's Lord because Jesus is Lord. And th there's that one saying, um, I forget where it's from the New Testament, there is no other name given among men by which you must be saved than by the name Christ Jesus or something like that. I forget what it is. But that was taken from Roman coinage. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be the, saved than by the name of Caesar Curion. I mean, they, they, they took a Roman slogan, <laughs> kind of plagiarized a Roman slogan. They took out Caesar and they put in Jesus. And they, whoa, whoa. I mean, they're, they're mixing politics and religion big time here, and they are a threat to the Roman Empire. And so the Roman Empire and the Caesar stuff you, you've seen some of those movies like Gladiator and stuff like that where any, anyone who was an enemy of the state got to fight the lions. And the score was always the same. The lions, 50. The Christians, zero. The scores always turned out the same. The Christians didn't make it very well. And when the Caesars were really upset, um, they would tar and feather, not tar, not tar and feather, but they would tar some Christians and put them on poles and they would light them up for their parties. Uh, we're, we're talking about a pretty debauched, society here, and the Christians were Los on Tombo because they would not pledge of allegiance to the Roman government, and that was seen as treason. That's treasonous. Well, Roman fell. Roman Empire fell. When it fell, this group of Christians still survived while the Roman Empire fell, and there were at least some sects which looked at the Roman culture and they saw that it was all about excess. It was excess in every form of sensual pleasure you could think of. I mean, they were party animals. Uh, um, it was not unusual for them to go to a party and eat so much that they couldn't eat anymore, so they go out back and stick their finger down the throat and up chuck so they can go in and eat some more. I mean, they knew how to party. <laughs> they knew how to keep it going for a long, long time. Um, it fell. And it fell because of corruption from within. And they, this group of Christians saw this debauchery and they associated that with the opposite of the lifestyle that they felt was good and right and holy. So that gave rise to something called the monastic movement. And the monastic movement looked at this excess and they said, 
Wow, wine, women, song, sex, everything. If that's the way that culture is, well then righteousness and goodness has to be the opposite of that. So the monks took a vow of celibacy and a vow of poverty because if this rich, opulent life was bad, then the opposite of that would be good. If sexual indulgence was bad, well, then we're not even going to be involved in that at all. We're going to be celibate over here because we want to be holy and, and, and worship God the right way, etc. So they had a monastic movement in which they came off by themselves and they wanted to live a spiritual life away from all physical possessions and all anything that was pleasurable. If it was pleasurable, it was kind of seen as like sin. So they didn't want to sin. They wanted to be over here spiritual and righteous and stuff. I'm oversimplifying it because I'm almost out of time for this particular section. But what happened was that these groups of monks would get together on some Roman road someplace and about a good walking distance day's walk, they would set up an area here and have a little monastery there and they would huddle together and they would work with their own hands and they would clear some land here and they'd maybe put in a grapevine or something, some grapes over here and some vegetables over here and they would live there and then they'd build up a little chapel and then they'd build up a place where they could live and, and they built their own little community and like some Monks today get up at 3 o'clock and say their prayers and quote their Gregorian chants and all this sort of stuff and do that three times a day. Pretty soon, pretty soon, they would have developed um, some income here that they could sustain themselves. And so these travelers would want to come and stay at these monasteries because you go in there, they shut the gates, and you're safe from cutthroats and bandits. Now, I, I joke and say that the, the, the travelers don't have to worry about getting their stuff stolen from because the monks wouldn't want to mess up their retirement plan. You know, if they start stealing from all these pilgrims and stuff, it's going to mess up their retirement plan, and so they want to get their reward sweet by and by. So now, as they do this, they start building up capital. Now they've got a vegetable garden, now they've got wine and or grapes, and now they've got so much grapes that they don't want it to go to waste because it's got green acres, and so they've got to turn it into wine in some way that they can store this valuable economic resource. But there's not enough of them, and so they get some of the kids from the village to come up, you know, and they wash their feet and put them in there and teach them little songs or something. They tramp out all that sort of stuff and get some grapes. And then they might give them something to take back to their parents or something, a free bottle of wine from last year or something like that. And it helps the kids, and the kids get some learning out of it and a good social event, etc. And the monks... The monastic movement wound up being the transmission belt for all of ancient history and ancient knowledge through the Middle Ages. So everything we know about Plato and Aristotle and everything we know about algebra and all that sort of stuff came through the monastic movement because they would have a chapel here and they would have an infirmary here and then they'd have a library here. And so the people who, who could afford to rewrite all the books, the scrolls, as they fell apart, had to be wealthy enough that they could devote time and they weren't scholarly enough to do that. Now, I call this the three robes here because when you graduate, one of the things that you'll do is you get to walk across the stage and they hand you this thing and you have this black robe on. Why are you wearing this black robe? Well, a black robe symbolizes a scholar someone who has attained some scholarly degree. Well, in the Middle Ages, who were the scholars? The monks. They were the scholars. I mean, you, you want to learn algebra, you want to learn a foreign language, you want to learn ancient history, you want to learn any of that. So they established the colleges, the first places you go to learn stuff, you know, and theological was part of it, but it was also other things like physics and math and all those sorts of things. So they'd build their chapel, they'd build their library and their monastery, their school and all those sorts of things. And if people had a problem because the neighbor's goat came out and it started eating up somebody's vegetable garden, what do you do? Shoot them? Right? End of goat, end of neighbor. Problem solved. Well, no, they would go to the monks here 
who had access to the law of Moses, and they say, okay, what's how we're supposed to handle this? You know, how much does he owe me for this? And how many times can he do this before we put him out of his misery and all that sort of stuff? So they would go there to, to settle and adjudicate civil cases because they had the book and they had the knowledge and all that sort of stuff. Now, if you go downtown here, there's a place there, and if the two people have a dispute between one another, Balaam says, all rise, and in comes this guy wearing a black robe. A black robe. Why? Well, it all comes back to this. This, because that's where they went to adjudicate their cases. And in some high churches to this day, high liturgy churches, the clergy still wear black robes. And so that's where this, this thing of black robes came in. Now, here's the economic part. Here's the part that ties in with the classical growth model. What did the monks do? Well, they didn't want to live like the pagan Romans in their debauchery. So in order to be good and righteous and pure little saints, they said they took a vow of celibacy and a vow of poverty. But they couldn't steal. They didn't want to steal. They worked with their own hands. And when they worked, they produced more than they consumed. Because they got all this wine here in the wine cellar. But could they, according to their own conscience, go down there and get drunk in the middle of the winter and drink up all their proceeds? Or would that be too much like what the Romans used to do? Just glutton. No, 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 you lead an austere lifestyle. And when they're clearing this land and they, they, they cut their hand, when they're trying to pull out some vine or something, they would look at that and that'd be painful. And they'd say, okay, pleasure is bad, pain is good. Oh, I, th th that's good. It's good to endure pain. That, that's, that's a holy or righteous lifestyle, to endure pain. Now, I'm characterizing to a little bit, but I think you're getting the picture here. These people wanted to be righteous, so that's why they took the vow of poverty. Now watch what happened when they took this vow of poverty and they worked. They produced more than they consumed. So that's why they had the kids come up here and do all this stuff, take some of the kids, and now they got stuff left over. They don't have enough room for storing their wine, so now they're going to take some of their wine, take it down to the blacksmith, and say, Mr. Blacksmith, we, we need a pick, you know, we need a shovel, we need a spade bar, and by the way, we could use that ox and that ox cart over there too. And once they take their excess, their savings that they didn't consume, they did not live up to the standard of living that they were capable of. They had enough there. They could have had some really good, fun parties. But no, that's bad. That's bad. We took this vow of poverty. We're going to live in poverty. We're not going to live in wealth. So they have this excess, so they take the savings, they put it into tools, they take it back to the, the, the monk's monastery here, and now how efficient are they at clearing land and building more buildings? Now they're really on a roll now. I mean, they're really pulling it in. And so now they keep growing, and they have enough wealth that they can build a college, they can, they can rewrite all these manuscripts and scrolls. Vow of poverty worked. They defer gratification. Rather than living up to the standard they could, they defer it, they save it, they take the savings, and they invest it in tools. Once they invest it in tools, now the tools make them more productive than they were before. And then they repeat that process year after year after year. And as they repeat that process year after year, the monasteries, ironically, and the people in them, become pretty wealthy. <laughs> Catch the irony. They take a vow of poverty, and what does God curse them with? Wealth. Ah, it's a strange world. Strange world, right? By the time we come to the end of the Middle Ages, through this monk strategy of wealth production, of course, the towns wanted the monastery because they were an economic powerhouse. They, they, they jump-started the rest of the community, and they created a lot of their productivity, created a lot of demand for the blacksmith, for the carpenters, for the stone builders, 
for for the people who are going to do all the stuff that they need to have done for clothing, all that sort of stuff. And by the time we come to the end of the Middle Ages, the church as an institution owned the majority of the landmass of Europe. Didn't steal for it, didn't have an army, didn't conquer anything. It just owned it. It just owned it. And so if a person wanted to be a prince or a king somewhere in Germany, they had to make this trip down to the, the bishop of Rome, kiss the hand of the pope, give him some money, and the pope might let him be a king someplace in Germany because the church owned most of the land. Now, this is, this is a world in which our churches today are a little bit higher in terms of social prestige than the Boy Scouts or the PTA have absolutely no economic clout. No economic clout. Personal clout, yeah, but no economic clout. We're talking about a situation where the church was the most powerful economic institution in all of Europe during this point in time. Just to push this point one point further here, in England there was a king, Henry VIII, and kings had to have sons, or there's going to be a revolution. There's going to be an internal fight. There's going to be a civil war over who's going to be the next king. So it's really important that you have a, you have a son, that you can pass it on down. Everybody agrees that's a son. But this particular king didn't have any son, and so he wanted to trade this model wife in for another model, a newer one, a flashier one that might be more conducive to having a son. And what did the pope say about that? No, 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 no. And so the king said, well, wait a minute, there's this guy over here in Germany. He's got this theological dispute of some sort. I don't know what it is. But he's thumbing his nose at the pope over here saying, no, he's he's Martin Luther guy. And if he can get away with it over some theological matter, look, I, I, I'm looking at a civil war here. So I'm going to tell, tell the pope, just take a hike. <laughs> I'm going to marry who I want to marry. Now, here's the, here's the moral here. At that point in time, what institution was the institution that everybody went to when they were sick and needed some hospital care? The church. The church did all that. And when they wanted to get education, where did they go? Well, uh, the, the church. And, and health, education, what, when they needed charity, where, where did the health, education, where did they go to get that stuff? The church. Ah. But when King Henry booted the church out, now all of a sudden, who owns all these cathedrals and who owns all these hospitals and who owns all this stuff? Oh, well, that's a sweet deal. Yeah, get a new wife and get all this property too. That's really cool. Problem. Up until this point in time, all those nuns and, and, and monks and stuff, they were in the process of deferred gratification. When were they looking for their payoff? When is payday for them? Not in this life. They have, that's the ultimate in deferred gratification. They get room and board and a lot of work for all their life, and they're looking for a reward a long time away. But if they're not going to work, are they going to work that hard for the king? Are they going to do that for the king? No, if they're going to work for the king, they want to get paid. Now, because they want to get paid, and now you don't have an institution that's willing to do that for free out of their religious obligation, out of their own internal stuff, now all of a sudden it's the king's job to take care of health, education, and welfare. Where is he going to get the money? I guess he's going to have to tax the people. That, in world history, is the beginning of our modern welfare state. That was the beginning of our modern welfare state. At that particular point is when most economic historians point to, when, when did our modern welfare state really begin where the government took over the responsibility of health, educational welfare? And they point back to this point in time. From your text, the classical growth model is savings, investment, increase in capital, creates economic growth. The way I spelled it out with our monk strategy of wealth production is the vow of poverty. They worked. They practiced deferred gratification. They postponed pleasure. They didn't spend the money that they had. They lived at a lower standard of living. They continued to tighten their belt. 
And with that gratification, they earned excess savings, which they turned into capital tools. Those tools made them more productive. And year after year, they became more and more wealthy and more and more productive. And it increased exponentially. That is my historical illustration of the classical growth model. The last thing is technological lock-in. I'm going to do that really, really quickly. Technological lock-in is the idea. We get used to doing things one particular way. And because we're used to doing that way, we don't want to unlearn it and do something different, differently. The classic illustration is QWERTY, the QWERTY keyboard. If you look at the keyboard, you go up to the left, Q, W, E, R, T, Y. And the reason that it's there is because when we created the first typewriters, they have this mechanical action. And you push on it, and a thing goes up and hits the ribbon and comes back. Push the next one, goes up and hits the ribbon. If you start typing faster and faster and faster, pretty soon it doesn't have time for this to come back. But this one goes up, and they clank in the middle and beat up on each other. So it was deliberately, I mean, if we wanted to be efficient, we'd put our vowels, A, E, I, O, and U, right underneath our home keys, right? So you don't have to reach for them all over the place. That'd be a whole lot faster because we hit, I mean, there's vowels in every single word. There's not a Z in every single word. There's not a W in every single word, but there's an A, E, I, O, U in every single word. So why don't they run our, key, run our key? Because we don't want people to type that fast or it messes up the typewriter. We don't have typewriters anymore. We don't have electric typewriters anymore. We have word processors now. But everybody's learned it this way. If we learned it differently, could we type faster? Yes. There's another keyboard. I forget the, the name of it. The, the Dvorak or something like that. Um, that we could use. But if I could type 25% faster, if I would just simply stop learning the keyboard I have and learn the keyboard all over again, do you think I really want to do that? To type 25% faster? Uh, I do, but I really don't because tomorrow I'm going to want to type something and I don't want to go through the process of relearning the keyboard. So that's an illustration of technological lock-in. It's locked in because we don't want to change. It's an inconvenient to change. Now, there's other versions of technological lock-in, which would be corporate technological lock-in through rules and regulations and government regulations that there could be technological lock-in, which does not allow for emerging technologies because of that macro government intervention lock-in, uh, but that's different than the one that I'm talking about with the QWERTY keyboard. That takes us down to the bottom of what I wanted to cover today.